Hello, for those of you who are going to be watching this by delay or on YouTube, uh, you'll be hearing this part, but I want to make sure for the people who are live that they'll be able to to um, hear this as well. So I need to check and make sure that we are indeed live, and as of now, we are. So I want to welcome today, I, I can't tell you how excited I am about this one. I guess I've done enough uh, previews on Facebook to uh, indicate my excitement for having um, my guest today on Our Stories, His Glory. Today's special for me because I get to have as my guest Mr. Jeremy Dibler. He's the co-founder and the lead singer of my favorite Christian group of all time, FFH. And you can see from the graphic, um, you probably will recognize him uh, and, and his wife, Jennifer. They're both in, have been in FFH uh, from the beginning. Jeremy founded the group, co-founded it with a friend of his, Brian uh, Smith. Uh, but again, they've recorded FFH, seven number one singles and 15 top 20 hits. And these will be found on the uh, Christian radio. And if you listen to Christian radio, I guarantee you, you've heard Jeremy and FFH. Jeremy grew up in Pennsylvania, lived in Nashville, Tennessee for a while, obviously, when he was doing more recording, spent some time in South Africa with his family. But now they live, he and Jennifer, in Irvine, California, with their two children, where they are now worship leaders at Journey Church. Now, I could go on all day about my favorite songs and all the things I know about FFH, but you didn't tune in to hear me. We want to hear from Jeremy Dibler. So after hearing all that, Jeremy, I hope you're having a good day and ready to do this. Man, that was a long and super descript introduction. Thanks for being so descript. Well, I, I, I have my job so much easier. Okay. Well, I was going to say that I'm a bit, I, I'm 57, Jeremy, and, you know, we talked a little bit before we went on just now, and uh, my, um, about 1997, 98 is when I discovered um, Christian Radio, where I was living at the time, and discovered FFH, and I got to admit, and my, I, I've got grown kids, my boys are 28, 25, and 21, and they call me a groupie. They say, you're just an FFH groupie, and occasionally they'll they'll just randomly play an FFH song because they know I'll stand up and get going. So I feel like a 15-year-old right now getting to talk to you, but I want to <laughs> get away from me. You and I met one time briefly at a hockey match when y'all were performing afterwards. I worked my way down to the locker room past security to get to, to, get to talk to you. But here's what I want to jump straight into because people are going to recognize a lot of these songs and we're going to talk about a few of them but I want to go back to the first time that you were maybe riding in the car and heard yourself on the radio on a song that you had written and recorded what was it like the first time that an FFA song hit the radio and you were able to hear it what what is that feeling like I mean, it was, and it was, it was magic. But here's the thing, you know, I think it would be different now. But you know, back in the late '90s, getting your song heard by people was really hard. The only way to do it was to have a song on the radio. I mean, That's now there's right. all these other different ports that you can. I mean, there's so many ways to get great music now. But at the time, you know, and so we had. We had made, we'd already made two or three independent recordings, and you know, none of them were fit for, none of them were fit for airplay. But we, we had the most recent independent record we had made. Um, we had gone in and, you know, at the time you, you literally took your CDs before that was taped. You took them to the radio station to try to get them to play. And you so you actually to took them to the radio station. Literally, wow. you hired someone hired someone to send them. But anyways, we took them to our local station in Pennsylvania. They liked them. They said, look, we're probably going to play three of this, three songs from this album in the next hour. So we went home and just tuned every radio we had to it and sort of ran around the house. <laughs> and and enjoyed we, hearing we, yourself. We ran around the house. It was, it was just like, my gosh, it's happening. Now, obviously, you and Jennifer were married by then, right? Was that the case? Well, yeah. We were we were still dating. Okay. She was visiting. He was visiting me from 
St. Louis when that happened. Well, wait, hang out. Uh, hang on a second. Maybe we were just married. Okay. Either way, it was it, it was definitely early on. That was actually, I mean, that was before Jennifer was an official part of the band. That Those songs were from an independent record that no one ever heard. But the local radio station was proud of it. And they're like, yeah, you're our local guys and we'll play you. And then the next album was the album where Jennifer had joined the band and... You know, that album became our first record lead, record deal album. Actually, we made that record as an independent band, and then the record label just bought it. We didn't have to re-record or anything. It was just, you guys did a great job with this record. We'll just make it, you know, we'll just, we'll just buy the masters from you. So, But here's the thing. Every time I hear us on the radio, or me, every time I ever have, I have turned it up and jammed to it. Did you really? It's, okay. It's, no, I mean, it's still, if it were to happen, it never gets old. Well, I'll just admit, every time I hear you on the radio, I I do the very same thing. I turn it up. I don't care who's in there with me. They're going to get it loud, and they're going to hear me sing, even though I don't sing near like Jeremy. And by the way, uh, I want to make sure I get this during our time. I have said before that Jennifer might have the best female voice I've ever heard sing a song, and uh you, you you obviously have a very good male voice, It's very, and your voice is very unique. I recognize your voice right away whenever I'm hearing something on the radio. It's um, unique, and when y'all two are together, uh, you know, it's fantastic. And that leads me to my next question, which is, um, back, back in the day when you first started, but even now to some extent, when you... When you're putting a record together, somebody's obviously written a song. Um, most of the time it was you, and sometimes you collaborated. But how do you determine if it's going to be a song you sing or if it's a song Jennifer sings or if it's one where you sing some together? Uh, I want to give you an example. You found me, my all-time favorite. You sing a little bit. Jennifer sings a little bit. And then there's a part where Brian sang a little bit. How do you put all that together to make the best song you can? The funny, way, by the way, that's also my favorite song. That's my oh, okay. Page. Um, that one in particular. Okay, so the way that most of it went down was, and still does to some extent. Some extent is I really don't write with a, a person in mind other than me, because you know it's me writing the songs. And then if it turns out to be one where Jennifer would sound great. And I might suggest it, or she may hear. I mean, she hears most fun. We live in a small house. Always have. She's always heard or been around whatever I'm writing. And so it's not like it's not like I write anything that she doesn't know about. And so there'll be times where she will say, "Hey, whatever that thing is you're writing right now, I really feel that. And I'd like I'd like to sing." So sometimes it's just worked out that way. And then having Mike or Brian sing small parts here and there on the records was more of a studio decision. We just like, it just needed, like if it just needed something else, something to make it more interesting. Um, I mean, that's, that's how you found me came about. I wrote, you found me by myself in my office one night. We started recording it and, you know, I was kind of syncing it through it. Jennifer was syncing it through it with me and I was like, Hey, well, this could be sort of a duet kind of thing. Yep. And then we got in the studio and realized some other stuff could be done better. So, I mean, that, that one in particular, was different. I wrote a lot of songs with Mike Boggs, who I know you know. Yeah. And so the ones that, the ones that we wrote together, sometimes I would say, because Mike's got a little bit more of a country history, and so yeah. and so does Jennifer. So I would say, hey, let's try to let's try to write this for Jennifer, Jennifer to sing it. So a couple of the tunes that Mike and I wrote together worked out good for Jennifer, but there was never, you know, I've, people have accused me that the songs sound formulaic, which you know I don't. I don't know if I speak to that, but there never really was a formula for us for deciding that stuff. It more was kind of just a work in progress until it was finished. And, and so when, when we hear the song, like, and I'll mention another one that's one of my favorites is I'll Join the Rocks, which I'm pretty certain you wrote as well. Um, it, it, I can't imagine it a different way. So I can't imagine it not having you and Brian going kind of back and forth in that song. And I'm sure it would have sounded good if you would have sang it all or Jennifer was in it. But it just seems to me that you um, you and the group have a knack for figuring out. So, for example, like one of them had to be when the one that where Jennifer sang, uh, I think it's Go and Follow Love, whatever that was. It, it was very obvious that was her. 
Um, so I'm assuming that that was probably written with her in mind, with her uh, having grown up in Oklahoma, being kind of a country girl, those kind of things. But uh, it just seems you guys always had a God-given ability to kind of construct it. But I will tell you that I bet you're going to tell me it's not as easy as I'm making it sound. That that songs just sometimes they just pop up, but other times it's probably a grind as well. Tell me kind of how you come up with a song and an album and put it all together. Um, well, it happened, um, it sort of happened in different ways for different songs. So you brought up Follow Love, which is one of my favorite FFH tunes. And it's, you know, it's been used a ton at like graduations and, you know, yeah. weddings and all that. Like, so uh, I really liked the chorus of that song. Um, I had written the chorus by myself and couldn't, I really couldn't figure out what I wanted to do with the verses. Um, and so I called this other songwriter named Scott Propane, who he and I had written a couple of songs together before. Uh, he's up in Seattle. And I said, hey, I've got some lyrics here and maybe a chorus. Do you want to take a look at finishing it up? And so he and I worked on that together. And as it came together, it was like, you know what? This feels like, because of the lyrics, because Scott wrote the rest of the lyrics about the small town and stuff. And I said, you know, this feels a little bit more like Jennifer's story, actually. Um, and so, you know, that, that that's how that came to be. But then there are other songs, like One of These Days, that's just a rock and roll song where yeah. we didn't try to overthink. It was just like, okay, I'm going to get in there with my guitar and sing a vocal, and then we'll build the rest around it. And, you know, because so some of them are, some of them are easier to sort of see the um, the workflow than others. But all that to say, I, I don't have a formula. I mean, I... My, the only thing that I have trouble doing is recording or even playing a song that I don't feel myself. So even if there's somebody else that wrote a song, like I've I've been kind of the lead on FFH songs that Michael has written, but I can feel, you know, about the sentiment. Like I'm like, you know, this this could be me. I, this is something I could have said. Yeah. If it's not, if if it gets to where it's like, and I've done some stuff before where you know I've I've agreed to record something or sing something or be a writer on something where I don't really feel it. And then I hear the finished product and I'm like, yep, I can tell. It's not, you know, it's, it's really not that great. So I, I want to take you through, and again, I think I told you we wouldn't necessarily go in chronological order, but um, okay, so I saw you in, several times um, in, in, the, in the years and I got the CDs and everything and but around 2006, I got a call, and <laughs> yeah, I hadn't told you about this one before we went on, but th there's a Cleveland County Fair. It's the big fair in our county, and they were all excited because they're going to have FFH come and perform. And somehow the, the county director got a hold of the fact that on my bucket list, I literally have this written on my bucket list in my document, that one of my bucket list goals was to introduce FFH in concert. And he called okay. and said, hey, they're coming, and I want you to MC and introduce them. And I was ecstatic. But then within a couple of weeks, he called back and said, hey, I've had contact with them, and they're, they're not going to be coming because they're not performing for a while. And, and I did some more research and found out that it's somewhat at the height of, uh, of popularity for FFH that you guys had decided to do a sabbatical, and that you and Jennifer – we're going to be going, and I guess at the time you had Hutch, and we're going to be going to South Africa. Uh, how did all that come about? I, uh, how did and describe the the decision making to get to that point, and how that uh, affected you guys' lives? Well, first of all, I apologize for asking your dreams on the rocks. <laughs> well, I'm gonna count uh, it for the. I'm gonna count today as as have. Okay. As having accomplished you know that. What? Look, we're still doing this. It's not like that can't happen. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I, I don't know why we can't make that happen. Fantastic. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's something we could work towards. Okay. I think we should try. I'm going to take you up on that if you're ever around this area. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, I had been invited, like like all my other answers today, I apologize, they're kind of, that's a long story. Africa is a long story for us. I had been invited in 2004, which, man, it seems so long ago now, to go with a group from Nashville to be the worship leader at what became sort of a Christian music convention in Cape Town. So the rules at the time, and I don't know if it's still this way, but the rules at the time in South Africa were that they could only play 40% of non-South African music. They wanted the rest of the music to be South African artists. And so they brought a few of us in from Tennessee, from Nashville, um, and hosted it at a church. And uh, we went and did this, you know, this, uh, I guess it was, you call it music, like sort of a music seminar kind of thing. Okay. It was at a church, and I was the worship leader for it every night and did like a small concert at the end. Uh, anyways, they invited me to do that in 2004. I just, just didn't feel right. They did the same trip in 2005. I had, was not a mission trip guy, Rusty. I mean, for me, it was like, ah, you know what, I'm... You go do that. I'm good here. Yeah. But I really did get the sense that it was the Lord inviting me to do something different and special. And I just started praying, God, you know, if you want me to go, then I will just, you know, it kind of just like, I'm, I'm going to go unless I, uh, I hear from you that I should. And so I did. I was there for two weeks, fell in love with the people and the place and um, the host church that was like hosting the event uh, said, would you consider coming back here for a six month stint as like, uh, I mean, it could be sort of a working sabbatical. You help us on the weekends and you get some rest and the rest part of it sounded really good to Jennifer and me. Cape Town's a beautiful city. So we lived, we would always wanted to live near water. So we lived near the coast and uh, we went through the, through the northern hemisphere winter, so we got to skip winter, be in the South African summer. Unfortunately, you know, we, we tried to pick the, the spots in the calendar that were best for everybody, but we knew we would have to probably cancel a couple of things or indefinitely postpone yeah. them. And so there were there were a handful of things that were already booked. We still waited, you know, quite a while to go, but th there are a couple of things that were on the calendar. But we ended up going... It was a life change for us. I mean, you can't, I mean, I don't think you can move to another country and rent a house and buy a car and kind of just integrate, like willfully kind of entangle yourself with the culture for six months and then have it not stay with you. And so when we came home from South Africa, uh, we had a lot of show offers. Actually, we had more show offers in those six months. I think we came back to 70 offers. Wow. And, but, you know, at the same time, the Lord had been working in everybody else in the band, and we were all really enjoying some, you know, us going to Africa really forced everybody else in our, sort of our core group, band, management, tour manager, all that, to just to figure out what it would be like if they didn't have FFH, and everybody unanimously sort of liked some of the normal. And yeah. so we didn't go right back to the band, uh, and then... Jennifer was pregnant with Sadie, so we we're like, well, let's not, let's at least not do it until after Sadie's born. So that was like November of that year, six months after we came home. And then I have MS and I had some treatment scheduled, and it was like, well, let's not do anything until after I get this first treatment, see how my body reacts. And, you know, before we knew it, we were, you know, a year and a half removed from touring. And when we decided to go back to it, which we did, uh, it ended up making sense for it just to be her and I as a duo because everybody else had sort of found a life that they they wanted, if that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Or that God was calling them to at that time in a different stage of their life, I'm assuming. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe God works that way where he, maybe God lets us know what God's best is for us by making us want it. Do you know what I mean? Sure, I yeah. Think, some of our understanding of God is skewed because we think that God is going to make us do something that we don't want to do. And 
you know, I don't, I just don't think that's what God is like. I think He sort of puts the want in us a lot of times, and then, you know, it makes it makes the process easier. And I think I'm reminded when you say that of Psalm 37, 4 that says, "Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart." So, what I've seen, what I've seen in my life that could parallel that is when the desires of my heart change. That could be God changing my heart for a different uh, period of my life to to do something, quote, out of the box or just make a change. Um, and so I want to ask you about the MS because you, um, you, you've you been inspirational to a lot of people because you haven't been shy about that. But I, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Jeremy, you do, uh, and I look at them every day. I can't believe how early you get up out there in California because mine's in my inbox by about 9 o'clock. But uh, you do a thing called the daily uh, during COVID where you play at the piano and basically do a, a short devotion. Um, and I've enjoyed those, enjoy them every day, daily. And recently you did one where you mentioned uh, the MS. And I, I think this is a great point that I would love people to hear and hear you share a little bit about. You mentioned that your hope came when you found out the truth and one of your devotions was about hope and truth and how they go together and that before you were diagnosed there was a lot of confusion a lot of fear and a lot of frustration maybe but once you found out the truth and MS is not a good diagnosis that's tough but you were actually relieved and it gave you more hope because you then knew the truth um, share with us about that so people can hear, especially people who may be going through something similar like that. Well, I mean, I, I know exactly which episode of the Daily uh, you are uh, referring to, and you're right, I do. And living on the West Coast and having the majority of the people who tune in to me live on, at least in Central or Eastern time, yeah, is like me. It is tough. I, that is one thing. If we were to ever move from here, my my mornings would get a lot later. Um, but, I can you know, imagine. Uh, the MS thing, um, I I had I had sort of lost. You know, I had uh, none. Growing up and then also, I mean, into adulthood, I had never really had anything go wrong with my body. So it did kind of hit me by surprise. I mean, I didn't think about my body much. I did. I mean, I thought about my weight. So when we were on the road, I'd try to get up and get a jog in or hit the treadmill. or And Jennifer, did. we, we did that too, but we weren't like fitness buffs or anything like that. But I also, I mean, still, other than my toe hitting it on the bedpost, I've never had a broken bone. I've never heard of surgery. Um, you know, it just wasn't on my radar. And then one morning I woke up and my arm was numb. So this is this is the same year as Africa. So this would be 2005. I can't believe 15 years ago. Yeah, it doesn't oh, fly by. It flies by. Yeah. yeah. And so I woke up one morning and I remember the morning and where I was because Hutch and I had slept over at our tour manager's house because he had a little boy the same age. And so we went down and had him sleep over and I slept on Matt's couch. And I woke up and I was like, man, my arm doesn't feel right. And uh, he, he was like, sort of just walked home and told Jennifer, I said, Some, something is not right either in my neck or my arm because my arm keeps going numb and I can't feel it. And then, you know, a couple of weeks went by and I was it was kind of like that. But because I played music, I was having trouble, like, making the guitar shapes with my left hand. So I was like, I got to really see somebody about this. And so... But before that, before this is kind of a funny story, before I went to see somebody, and you know, I'm, I'm on the on the spectrum. I I'm one of the people that goes to the doctor kind of later than earlier. I yeah. Kinda wait. It's a it's to, I have historically waited till it's more of a problem than it should be. But anyways, we had a trip that we had planned with my mom's family to go to the Jersey Shore, which is the beach that I had grown up going to. And we were really excited because we were going to take Hutch. So it was going to be his first time. So we went. And my mom, all the women in my mom's family, they, they work at hospitals or have worked at hospitals. My mom worked at the hospital. She's also been a hospice nurse. My grandma was a hospital chaplain and a registrar. And so they all think that they're doctors. Yeah. And 
by the by the time that I left that beach trip, I was diagnosed with all kinds of stuff. Um, <laughs> my mom and her mom, and I mean, I had a pinched nerve. I had something wrong with my neck. I had my, you know, my arm. Was, yeah. They had, which I wish they would have been right because the stuff that they had told. But they were like, "Look, you got to go to the doctor." So mm-hmm. as soon as we got home, back to Tennessee, I went to the doctor. The doctor's like, "Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> oddly enough, he thought maybe my grandma was right. He goes, sounds like you have something pinched in there." And by this time, it had moved on from numb to excruciating pain. I mean, just pain like I hadn't felt before. And then it moved to my leg, and, and you know, and I had to start taking pain pills and all stuff. Anyways, I went back. That doctor did a whole bunch of tests. I went back, and it was one of those kind of, "Hey, you might want to sit down for this kind of moments." And I didn't see it common, Rusty. That's the thing. I didn't yeah. ask Jennifer with me. I had no idea I was going to get any other news that I had a pinched nerve and possibly like some carpal tunnel or something. Yep. And he's like, hey, man, I need you to sit down. And he went through all the possible scenarios. He's like, it isn't a pinched nerve. It isn't this. It isn't that. We don't know what it is, but you're going to have to go see this guy and this guy and get a whole bunch of tests. And he threw out like a brain bleed or a tumor or MS. And, he, you know, and that just spun me into fear, like the fear of the unknown. And when I, when I, took, when I say fear, it wasn't like I was like a little bit anxious. It was, I'm not going to see my kids graduate. I'm not going to be able to walk my daughter down the aisle. I'm not going to be able to play music i mean what about all these people i mean it was like i was scared to die yeah and i i'd never really faced that before and it it put me into a dark space and and once i was diagnosed they they actually said man look your your brain chemistry is not working correctly you've got a neurological disease so it makes sense that you went to these places of fear and dread and depression and but during that time, I remember when I finally got the MS diagnosis, like after the spinal taps and the nerve testing and all that, they were like, yeah, man, textbook MS, you have it. That news did not make me scared. It made me sad. You right. know, it was like, this is, a, but, it, but it also, there was some freedom in it. It was like, okay, I know what this is. And... Now that I know what it is, and I mean, and there was, I mean, he he gave me some, <laughs> he, he's like, look, without treatment, here's your prognosis, and the prognosis was not awesome. Yeah, but I can imagine. He, he's like, I think we can get some treatment, and, you know, not long after that, I got in line for a clinical trial for a drug that's now being regularly used, and I got to be one of the first patients that got this kind of chemo. I got it in 2007, 2008, and... Rusty, I have been in remission now for, I don't know, since then, you know, so 13 years. Wow, praise the Lord for that. That looks a little bit different. Like, remission doesn't mean that you just feel great. It just means your your disease hasn't progressed at all. And, um, I mean, in God's great kindness, that's where I am right now. I mean, I, we, I, I know that if you don't live in a warm place, this sounds like I'm bragging, but I just... For my exercise, I swim laps because I don't get you know too hot, and when you get too hot, it makes your MS worse. And I just came back from swimming laps and got on this call with you. So oh wow, that's, that's and you know you just had to throw that in. It's forty degrees here in North Carolina. Uh, so. <laughs> man, listen, the, uh, I know that a lot of the people back east, because I used to be one of them, think that us Californians are wing nuts. But when you get out of here, <laughs> when you get out of here during the winter, you go. Actually, maybe you're not so dumb. Yeah. So yeah, that I've got cousins in California that live in Simi Valley, and I, I so I can relate a little bit. I want to let people hear too, because I've got a few other things I want to make sure we get to. But that wasn't the only adversity that you and your family had to face. It, it's an incredible story of what happened when you were in Nashville in 2010. People may remember 10 years ago when the floods came through Nashville, and uh, what they may not know about FFH. Um, husband and wife uh, Jennifer and uh, Jeremy and Jennifer Dibler is that you guys lost most everything in that flood. It, it wiped you guys out. Tell me how that affected it, uh, you um, physically, spiritually, emotionally, and how how y'all made it through all that. Um, man, that is that's a good question because I think in some ways. 
we're still we're still healing, I think, from some of that. Because so I got sick and then got my treatment, but we were back out on the road. I was feeling better. Um, we had bought by that time we had bought our own bus, and so what we were doing is Jennifer and me and Sadie Claire and Hutch, who were really little at the time, and our stupid dog, we would bus to the dates, and I would drive us. And then the rest of the band and the tour manager and anybody else who was with us that on those shows would fly in. And so it gave us a way to be just sort of an autonomous family but still be in the band. Yeah. But it was exhausting. I mean, because, you know, we would be driving show to show, you know, hundreds of miles. And uh, I was getting jealous of the band guys. <laughs> yeah, man. They were getting fly. Anyways, so here's why I tell the story. So that winter, which would have been like the winter of, I don't know, 2009 or something, my, my dates get mixed up. We were off for a while, and so we leased our bus out to another band. And while that band was out on tour, thankfully no one was hurt, but the bus burned to the ground. Oh my, I didn't and, know that one. Yeah, and yeah. so we <laughs> actually, they called me. And they're like, hey, man, we just want to let you know the bus is on fire. And it's we're trying to put it out, but we just want to let you know. And I didn't believe them. I thought it was a practical joke. I was like, yeah, whatever. And then they sent me a picture of it. Like, anyways, Ooh. the reason I mentioned this is that we had, I had, I don't, I mean, I'm usually not good with this stuff, Rusty, but for whatever reason, I had taken out of the correct insurance policy when we leased that bus out, and insurance covered it. Okay. They covered it. They covered it to within a thousand, one way or the other. Yeah. And so when 2010 happened, we were in Missouri visiting Jennifer's family at the family farm, and we were, I think we were asleep. And I woke up to a text. My sister-in-law said, hey, you guys might want to check on your house. My sister-in-law lives in Franklin. And we were visiting Jennifer's family in Missouri. And she's like, hey, we're having a lot of rain down here. You might want to check on your house. Call. Because we had somebody staying at our place. And she sent me a picture of the, like a, a video of the news feed of a house floating down I-24. So... Anyways, we did. We packed up that day. We drove whatever the six hours down to Franklin, and we had had some water damage and mold was growing. Um, and it does it doesn't take long for mold to sure. start. Yeah. And, and what had happened was mold was sort of growing behind one of the walls, but in the midst of that remediation, the company that was remediating the mold inadvertently set up something that's not a negative airspace or is a negative airspace anyways they made the matter worse and the house ended up having to be completely gutted and you know re resorted redone from the inside out to remediate it properly and so we we really basically lost everything we ever owned because because it had been exposed to this toxic kind of mold which was um which was somewhat rare, but we went through all the testing, and because these things had been exposed, it was way it was way cheaper to buy a you know an eight hundred dollar couch than it is to pay five thousand dollars to have it cleaned. Sure. And so that I mean it was the same way with everything. I mean they'd be like, do you guys want to have this cleaned? And then it would be like, well, how much does it cost to have it cleaned? Well, five grand. Well, they will know it's a three hundred dollar piece of furniture. Like, and so we we did that. They, you know, for for several days. Jennifer watched as these guys in hazmat suits brought everything out of our house and paraded it by Jennifer, and then she would say, keep it um, and clean it or toss it. And the majority of the stuff was just tossed because, you know, to, unless it was an heirloom, uh, buying it new would, would was way easier. So we moved into a little rental house. We tried to work with that company for a long time. We ended up having to get lawyers involved, which – you know, it didn't feel right from the beginning, but also closing it up didn't feel right. It was weird. We didn't have a feel right. And, I, and we, so I don't know. I don't know if we did the right thing or not, but we held on for a while trying to get the money. Couldn't. And so it ended up, it ran us completely dry. I mean, we moved out here to California with, you know, 
what should have been somewhat of a nest egg from touring and royalties, and, but we just came out here with nothing. Really? Because, wow. But yeah, by, by the time we had our house repaired and you know we were paying mortgage and also a rental house and all that, by the time we had it repaired and everything done, uh, we you know we rented it out and then eventually sold it. But by the time we had it you know ready to move in, we had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on it, um, and so we just had to. We just had to sort of cut our losses and move on. And I think, I think that's probably the thing. One of the things that you know, a year or so later, when we when we started thinking about moving out here, I think we needed because of that, because of the the trauma and the drama of the flood, and you know, people who lost their house in the flood were swept away. Yeah, they got taken care of by insurance companies, but. No FEMA money went to anybody who had any mold damage or anything like that. Right. And, yeah. And so, and so really, it was we just needed to we needed to get away for a while. And this has been a good healing spot for us out here. And it's not because you know we have nothing against Franklin. In fact, my you know Jennifer's entire extended family is there now within ninety minutes of Franklin. So that you know that sure could be in our future again. I just I feel like when the opportunity to come to Orange County came up. We didn't have as much time as down to Tennessee, and I wanted to get some training. You know, um, I had been a resident worship leader for our home church in Nashville, Jennifer, we together for four or five years, but I still wanted to get better at it and get better training, and this opportunity out here, um, a journey. Journey is a smaller church community. It's in Irvine, which is in the middle of Orange County, and it it's not super growth motivated because there would be nowhere to grow. Like there's no property left or something like that. Right. And so it's, it's a bit more of a restful church worship experience because the expectations are different in a church like journey. The expectations are more like, well, our growth has to be depth because we don't, I mean, literally our parking lot is too small to fit any more cars. <laughs> so, uh, so this has been great, and that being part of a community like that has been great. And they, they, uh, Journey's been generous and put me through a lot of training and um, got me through becoming a spiritual director and the stuff that you know, the stuff that I want if I'm going to be helping people, but also the stuff that I want for music and artistry. And I want to know more how our spirits work and what our souls are like, because I feel like it helps us to understand what God is like. And I want music, the music I make, to help people understand what God is like. Sure. And, hey, that's what I wanted to, to mention at one point in time, that you when I, every concert that I went to was not a concert. It was a worship experience, and uh, the concert always had witnessing uh, and members. It always had an opportunity for uh, you know, the gospel for people to, in many cases, I think, respond. So in a sense, your concerts, you were already a worship leader in that context as well. So I'm I'm thinking after, a, you know, I was able to, to get you um, to agree to come on, I, I looked up the, the website for Journey Church, and I'm thinking, boy, if I was in Irvine, California, I know where I'd be going, <laughs> you know, to, to hear them. But I, I, I really believe that. Uh, and one of the reasons I wanted to have you on and people to hear your heart is that for you, it's much more, and it's always been much more than writing songs and trying to get hits and trying, but that it truly is a calling from God and that that's your motivation, not any kind of stardom, not any kind of wealth, not any kind of look at me, but a deflection. When you, when, when I look at the stage, I could almost see you guys all trying to deflect the glory upwards toward the Lord and having taken my children to your concerts when they were younger, I just want to let you know I appreciate that because and I respect that because uh, that is not always the case but with FFH I always knew it was a safe worship experience and a, a real worship experience for my kids so I'm assuming that still happens now uh, just in a different context with Journey Church there yeah, it does happen now, but differently. It's probably, you know, when we when we were out playing concerts, and you know, most of what we did was, uh, I don't want to say highly rehearsed to where it was like uh, insincere, but 
you know, when you go play a concert for people who have bought tickets to hear what you're doing, they they do have an expectation of, hey, yeah, we want to hear these songs. And so we played a lot of FFH songs, and when we're out playing, I mean, oddly enough, FFH never broke up. I mean, we could easily just start going playing concerts if we wanted to. Yeah. And if and when we do, we'll play FFH songs and figure out ways to make sure that kind of the spirit of the experience, I know that's kind of an ethereal way to say it, but like, I think people understand like when they, when I say spirit of the experience, like you could have this when you go to dinner at a friend's house and, and on the drive home, you might look to your husband or your wife and go, you know, something felt off about that. Or, you know, you might go to something or maybe it's church and you get in a car and you go, you know, that just, something just felt great about that. Sure. And so I think what, makes like a really great feeling experience is when there's like artistry when you can watch an artist do what they do well but then you can also participate in something that is unique to that night so we purposely would i would map out the first four songs and i would almost tell everybody every night hey here are the first four and then because we played so much music together and this still happens i could could sort of just then dinner for two I and mean, she would kind of give me a nod if she was sensing something but i could kind of know what the audience by that time makeup was and what kind of the sense of the night was going to be you know one of my one of the best worship leaders i've ever met his name is travis cultural he leads worship for beth moore at her events and he mm-hmm. and our friends he told me one time he said you know i just try to stay like one heartbeat ahead of where everybody else is experiencing experiencing God. And so uh, that's kind of a good description of what I would do. I would just kind of wait to see and still do, and then insert things into the moment that are, you know, people can participate more and kind of express the way they feel towards God. Now it's the opposite. Now most of it is corporate worship music that I play at Journey. And then I have to figure out ways to insert artistry music where people can just sit and listen yeah, to. Right. Um, but we're, you know, we're kind of dreaming and scheming about that a little, a little bit now because COVID, I think, is going to have a lasting effect on the way people want to worship together. I sure. don't think, I don't think people are going to want to come to back, back to church indefinitely and have it be the same as it was. I think they want to have an experience with God. Um, and I don't, I mean, that doesn't mean we have to like throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I do think that at Journey, we might try some things that we wouldn't have been able to before because it's been a year for people out here anyways that, to have been to normal church, and I think they'll be more open to it. So in that respect, I kind of hear uh, behind the FFH um, as far as maybe some concerts and maybe some releases. Uh, that we may not be done yet, those of us who are craving more. And in fact, I looked it up, and um, I think that in October or so, there's a new song, uh, Soul Finds Rest, maybe. Is that, yes. is that uh, I, I think, I, I saw it on YouTube, I believe. And I want you to tell me about that and maybe what might end up happening with, you know, going forward for FFH. But I also want you to tell folks, uh, especially like me, the best way to be able to purchase because I know things have changed in this wacky world. I used yeah. to buy your CD. Is it yeah. iTunes, Spotify, yeah. Google Play, YouTube? What's the best way people can get FFH I and Jeremy Dial? I don't know anybody who's manufacturing like actual product anymore. Just You can go – I mean, if you go to FFH uh, on the Internet, on the Googles, yeah. or, or if you uh, – if you go to FFH or Jeremy Dibler or Jeremy Sean Dibler or Jennifer, it all takes you to the same place and you can watch and uh, you can click and download and stream and all that stuff. So just a search of Jeremy Sean Dibler dot com um, will bring up all the stuff and it'll probably take you to the daily too. And I appreciate you mentioning those that I mean, it's been kind of a fun way for me to stay in touch with people. Yeah. Hey, before we before I talk to you about Soul Finds Rest, though, I I told you that there was no way Jennifer was going to join us because I told you she was working on a project with yeah. Sadie, a gingerbread thing, but she just came in to say hi. Hi, yeah. Jennifer. I, I I'm all struck. I'm sorry. I was doing fine with Jeremy, but now Jennifer's on, and I'm, I've already proclaimed you the best female voice in the history of music a, a oh little my. bit earlier. And um, you're thank my you. favorite person ever now. 
Well, good. I, I would hey, but I also have have done a lot of reading over the years, and Jeremy openly admits that he married up. Um, <laughs> in the sports world, we call that out punting your coverage, and and right. so um, we would we would all agree with that. And I and I don't Aww. I know you just came in, but we we talked about some of your songs, and um, uh, follow love is uh, just like something that melts my whole family. My wife and I still listen to it on the. CD and uh, I'm excited to hear all the things you guys are doing now there at Journey and I know that your your album uh, the one the way we worship was pretty much you being a mother and um, I just yeah. think, I think a lot of people are inspired by that so take a moment to tell me about all that. Oh goodness, well when Hutch was born, we just would go on walks and sing hymns to him all the time, um, and then at night I would just sing to him. And so we wanted to record those songs so that the kids would have it. Because um, I sang to Sadie, too, but mostly Hutch. She didn't enjoy it as much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Hutch, if I would sing, he would immediately fall asleep. Um, so. Which is, not, wait a minute now. I'm not sure what that says, but. I know, I was going to say, like, I don't fall asleep when you begin to sing, but I, I'm assuming it was because it's soft and wonderful and it was mom. <laughs> So we just wanted to record those, and um, so we made it into a into a record. And we called it the way we worship because I worship with a lot of those hymns. I grew up with them. We both did, and so those are worshipful to me. So, if I may, and I don't want to keep, my, I want to honor y'all's time because I know uh, it's precious time, especially with your family. But uh, in all seriousness. Uh, Jeremy was very fortunate to, to marry up, as we say, but w <laughs> what attracted you guys together as far as like uh, where we're, we have music in common? At what point in time is like we're, we're going to be married and have a ministry together? Oh, gosh. I made you. Yeah, he made me. I mean, so. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't what I was expecting to hear, but go with it. <laughs> well, we met in Nashville. And then kind of hung out all week. And I could just picture us together. It was weird. Um, but I didn't sing in front of anyone. Like my parents, maybe, you know, only. But, and my mom would try to get me to sing in church. And she offered me, I'll give you $100 you'll just sing in church. <laughs> and I was like, no way. Well, you would have been a professional at a young age. That's right. And so when I met Jeremy, we would sing together in the car. And... Um, and he was like, we sound good together. And I have, if I had ever heard him sing before that or known how, like, how professional he, he already was, I would have never really? felt okay. the freedom of him, never. And so then we would sing around the piano because he would play piano, we'd sing, and then he was, he would just be like, you know, you need to, he kind of just forced me into it. Well, there was, there was one day in particular, so. We had a friend, we had a mutual friend that we met when we were attending a camp meeting. This wasn't playing music at it. Um, he was, okay, so he was an evangelist that went around to like Methodist camp meetings in the summer. Are you familiar with any of that? Yes, yes. I mean, because it, it is, an East, it is an, East, an East Coast thing, really a Northeast thing. So we, he asked us to come. And he'd heard me play music before, but he said, why don't you and Jennifer come to some of these things that I'm doing and lead worship? He had never heard her sing, but I was like, yeah, we sing together in the car. She can handle it. She's pretty good. And so he booked a couple of them with us. I'm out visiting Jennifer in St. Louis. I'm, we're playing music. We're singing around the keyboard. And she, I can't get her to do anything. So she went upstairs to her room to mow the towel. Never. And I went up and I told her, I said, yeah. I said, I really want to do this with you. And we were still dating at the time. I said, I want to do this with you. We sound good together, but I can't, I can't try to make you anymore. You're just going to have to, you're going to have to agree to do it. And then I'll let that simmer. And not long after that, she was like, you know what? I'm scared. So you have to work with me, but I do want to do it. And then from there on, we just got really comfortable. It took me a long time. I was really scared. I mean, you've seen us play music. So yes. You know, we, I we just would never have dreamed that. 
I never would have dreamed it. You've seen us play music, though, and you know we have a little bit of a shtick where I can kind of I can kind of poke fun at Jennifer on stage because she won't talk. She doesn't want to talk in front of people, but she really won't. And so we kind of have this bit where I can kind of say what I want, yeah. and she can just make faces, and it's actually it's served us it's served us kind of well because it's not like it's not like I have someone it's not like my partner in this music thing always wants to talk and always wants to be out front and you know what I mean there yeah, is none of that sure. just you know it's just and it's still it's hard to explain it's like a chemistry thing there'll be people that say hey I want you to come play music for me and I'll go, and I'll be like yeah I think I can do it and they're like but actually we really want you to bring Jennifer because it's just not the same without Jennifer and so you which know, is still, what kind of how I felt about this interview but I did not want to say that uh, to you <laughs> Well, he, uh, yeah, I came in here because he's like, I know you're busy, but they, and I was, anyway, well, like, I, 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 probably, so I'm like, oh, yeah, I thought, I thought, but you're doing a gingerbread thing and saying, yeah, we were doing a garland. Oh, garland. Well, okay. this shows me that the uh, mother of the year every year is Jennifer, and I, I, I can oh, tell you that having, so well, I've read a lot, and I've, I've kept up with you guys through the years, and I don't, you know, you can go back and hear later what I'll, Jeremy and I you, talked about. Let um, me ask you this, Rusty. Sure. Honestly, let me ask you this. What time in the morning do you think the mother of the year would, would wake up? <laughs> Shut up. Like, what would be the waking time <laughs> for someone that you might call mother of the year? I'm wanting to keep uh, Jennifer Dobler on my side of this, so I'm not going to answer. Um, I know <laughs> that the dad is up and doing videos at 6 in the morning, but I don't want to say no, what time. Like now, mom has to get up during the night if she has to. We know all that. So. That's right. I have to be available. Yes, and you got to sleep with one eye open. So I'm, That's I'm giving right. you a break on that. That's it's, right. You're being a suck up. That's not <laughs> you're exactly right. The last thing I want in the world is Jennifer Dabler upset at me. Um, let me let me tell you that is a true statement. Yeah. <laughs> That's a universal truth. Okay. Well. Universal truth. Well, the mother of the year or not, you do not want her angry. Well, I I just want to tell both of you as we begin to wrap up that this is like I'm 57. I'm like a 15 year old getting his Christmas wish list uh, because of having been a fan a long time and. I could start singing the lyrics. You wouldn't want me to do that, but I could tell you the lyrics of most most of the songs, and I can put a, a a story of our family with it, of where we were and when we heard it. And they, as I told you earlier, Jeremy, they make fun of Dad all the time because I'm like a giddy kid when FFH comes on or we put the CD in. And, and Jennifer, they taunt me. I was telling him they taunt me. My kids will taunt me. We'll just be sitting around and be real quiet, and they'll get their phone. And all of a sudden, it'll start with, you found me real loud. And they all start laughing because they know. I'm, I'm like, that's it, that's it. you got to hear that. And they use it They use it to kind of pester me a little bit. Um, <laughs> hey, now that I know now that I know your fandom, uh, send email, text me your address to the number that, that you called me on. I have I'm, I'm, someone designed some T-shirts for me based on the daily, and they just, like, say Jeremy Sean Dival yeah. on them. And, been thinking to myself, who in the world would ever wear this? I could, I could, I could wear I that. <laughs> yeah. So send me your address, and I'll make sure you have it. Yeah, and um, unfortunately, I don't think Jennifer's on the. Is she? She's on my graphic here now. Y'all are going to be able to see that later because I'll share it with you uh, to your page. Uh, but both okay. of y'all are on there, and I got you one of your family uh, as well. So yeah, you know what? Extra large T-shirt. I, I like them a little big. I probably like a large. Look. It's coming at you. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to have it there before Christmas. Wow. I'll I'm going to get sleeves on the back patio, but it was good to talk to you. Now you guys can talk about Soul by Dress. Yeah, well, I'm going to wrap it up here. I do want to say something to both of you real quick, Jennifer, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Is, is she still there? I want to, okay. on behalf of all the people for many, many years who have been inspired and grown closer, closer to the Lord because of your music, I just want to personally thank you guys for your obedience because um, there's a lot of places you can go with your life but when you go directly what you believe is within the will of the Lord and use your unbelievable talents to try to draw people closer to the Lord there's many many lives that you two 
have affected that you'll never know that you affected and that the ripple effect. And I, I just want to thank you for that because I know personally I'm one of those and I know my family has benefited by me being able to stick that CD in, especially when they were younger, before they moved out and know that what I was hearing was inspired by the Lord. And so I just want to thank you both for that as we begin to wrap up. No, you're welcome. Thanks for saying thank that. You. That I mean that mean that means a lot to us. And we really appreciate that I mean I especially appreciate that you hung in with us even through, you know, us sort of going dark here for a couple of years out in California. It's you know, it's really nice to have people who have kind of stayed with it and learned the story. He, he was talking before he kinda of knew about the flood and he knows he knows Carl Cartier and Mike. Oh, okay. So yeah, just tell Jennifer we, we have a lot of mutual friends actually. Okay. Uh, and now I've got two more. How about that? That's fantastic. That's right. Well, um, I'm going to hang up here in a moment, Jeremy. And what I'll do is, um, is again, this was on Facebook Live, but people can watch it by delay. I'll, I'll tag you on it and share it to you, and then you can decide whether to post it. And it'll be on YouTube. And, and people that, and I'll try to put your website down in the comment section so people want to get caught up. Because I had a lot of people reach out in the last couple of days and say, oh, I love FFH. What's going on with them now? Well, now they know. And they know how to and, and by, how to get your music. And by the way, I'm, once I finish here, I'm going to go turn on the radio. And I'm really going to hope that either the first Noel or One Silent Night comes oh. on so I can hear one of those. Uh, with you with you performing those but thanks again guys i really appreciate you no. being on and um look forward to uh maybe uh staying in touch by email or something that's right no yeah text me your text me your address and let's stay in touch for sure okay well uh, jeremy again you have a great day and i'm gonna let you go now and i'm gonna do about a 20 second wrap up of the show and uh god bless you and your family and your ministry and thanks again for making my day no problem, Rusty. And if we can ever come do anything, play music down there for you or with you or whatever, just call. And I'll gonna... I'll introduce you in concert. That's what I'll do. Yeah, all right. <laughs> you have a great day. All right. You too. Okay. Bye. Well, for those of you who made it through that, um, I did. Um, I can only tell you that that was uh, one of my favorite ones that I've ever done because uh, not only did I get to talk to Jennifer, but I mean, Jeremy, but then Jennifer came on, and uh, I'm going to go get my CDs and just start listening to them. What a, what a great, our stories, his glory. Not all, these, these folks, uh, you know, have sold many, many, I think, in the millions of, of CDs and things, and yet you heard their struggles. Um, Jeremy shared things that he went through with MS and then uh, with the Nashville flood. Uh, human beings who had to reach out and trust the Lord. That's why... Everybody has a story, and our stories are for his glory. Thank you for tuning in. I'll be back soon if the Lord's willing and the creek don't rise. God bless.